In today's lecture, we're going to be talking about the first examples of squiggly bacteria that we're going to talk about in this course, Campylobacter and Helicobacter. These organisms have variable morphology from sort of comma shape to corkscrew to very tightly coiled spirals. These organisms are all gram-negative. Both of these organisms can be a challenge to grow, requiring specialized techniques. So Campylobacter are microaerophilic. They require nutritious media, so they really need blood. And some of them are able to grow at elevated temperatures as well, so up to 42 degrees Celsius. Helicobacter are even more challenging. And because of the difficulties of propagation, culture-independent methods are oftentimes used in diagnostics. Both of these genera are biocontainment level two organisms. In this image here, you can see a pure culture of Campylobacter um, depicting the variable morphology. So this organism here almost has a seagull shaped appearance, the way a little kid would draw a bird. Well, this organism up here has a few more squiggles. So this variability is really important to recognize. Enteric Campylobacter species tend to have a morphology which varies with the age of the culture. So a very fresh overnight culture may be very, very squiggly. And as those plates get older and older and are incubated longer, the organisms can straighten out and become almost like a, a straight rod. Here's a scanning electron micrograph of Campylobacter jejuni. Um, you can see just how squiggly it is, and again, the variability. This is a scanning electron uh, micrograph of Helicobacter, and I think you can appreciate that they are kind of spiral-shaped. It almost is like a, a screw. Um, they have periplasmic fibers wrapped around the organism, so this is involved in their uh, motility, as well as these uh, flagella that come off either end of the organism to help them move around. Both of these genera are host-associated. Uh, for Campylobacter, we tend to think of them occurring in primarily the intestinal tract, and this is certainly where they're found in many species of birds and mammals, but we also see them in uh, the reproductive mucosa. So particularly of our ruminant species, we can see Campylobacter fetus uh, subspecies in uh, the vagina, prepuce, um, and also potentially the gallbladder of cattle. Helicobacter are found in the stomach and gastrointestinal tracts, and it's actually estimated that approximately 50% of people are colonized with Helicobacter pylori. We have 44 species of Campylobacter and 53 species of Helicobacter. Among our Campylobacter species, we can differentiate them based on their growth requirements. So Campylobacter fetus, both subspecies, so fetus fetus and fetus venerealis, will grow at 25 degrees. Uh, Campylobacter jejuni can be differentiated from other Campylobacter species by its ability to hydro hydrolyze hippurate. When it comes to virulence, not a lot is known about Campylobacter fetus or our Helicobacter species. For Campylobacter jejuni, because it's a really important human pathogen, um, more studies have been done. And so we know that they're motile, they have flagella, um, they have outer membrane proteins which are um, involved in adhesion. They produce superoxide dismutase and catalase, so enzymes which help them to deal with uh, reactive oxygen species, and then toxins which lead to cell death. These organisms are involved in a variety of clinical presentations. So Campylobacter fetus, um, we generally think of as a reproductive pathogen. So fetus subspecies venerealis in cattle causes infertility and early embryonic death. While fetus subspecies fetus is one that we tend to associate with small ruminants, although we can also identify it in cattle, um, and it's a cause of abortions. Campylobacter jejuni, subspecies jejuni, causes enterocolitis in people, a really important cause of foodborne illness, and it may cause enteritis and diarrhea in other animal species. Campylobacter coli causes enterocolitis in pigs, Obseliensis in dogs can cause enteritis, and then there's a wide variety of Helicobacter species, which can cause gastritis in potentially many animals. It's best established in people, um, and in animals, the evidence is variable, depending on which host and which species of Helicobacter we're talking about. We're going to start off talking about Campylobacter fetus, subspecies venerealis. 
Um, the colloquial name of the disease caused by this organism in cattle is vibriosis. So this is really a, a bit of a historical um, designation. Um, some of those Campylobacter organisms can have a comma-shaped appearance, which you may remember from our previous lecture, looks a little bit like a Vibrio species. So that's where the name comes from. It causes a range of syndromes, which vary from silent carriage, animals which have no clinical signs. We can see temporary infertility, early embryonic death, and even abortions, although these rarely exceed 10% at a herd level. Disease and clinical manifestations typically occur when cows are exposed for the first time. So it's sort of a, a naive animal issue. What happens is the organism ascends from the vagina and we get an intrauterine infection. The organism can be transmitted to the cow either venereally through natural breeding or artificial insemination. Cows tend to naturally clear the infection, so they do get rid of it on their own. Um, but there are vaccines available as well, which can play a role in prevention. In this image here, uh, we have a cytological preparation. So I think you can see these large desquamated epithelial cells. And then here we have a few Campylobacter organisms swimming around the field as well. So this is Campylobacter fetus on cytology. Uh, C. fetus fetus, so subspecies fetus, um, we think of as primarily associated with small ruminants. Um, it causes abortion in the final six weeks of pregnancy and use. And in these animals, you may see pyrexia, so they may be febrile, and also have uh, vaginal discharge. Like I said, it can also cause abortions in cattle as well. However, the, the mode of transmission of this organism is different than C. fetus venerealis. It's thought to be transmitted through ingestion. So it's consumed by the animal. It travels uh, through the portal vasculature um, to the gallbladder and ultimately makes its way to the pregnant uterus. Within a flock or herd, this is highly contagious, um, and the incubation period from exposure to clinical signs is sort of between one and three and a half weeks or so. Abortion outbreaks can be controlled with antimicrobials, and vaccination also plays a role. This is an image from an aborted uh, lamb, and what we can see is multifocal hepatic necrosis. So here we have the liver, and there's these little foci of coagulation necrosis. It's maybe a little bit lighter, um, clearly abnormal. So in the abortus, um, we can see pathological lesions uh, associated with these infections. Human infections with Campylobacter fetus subspecies fetus are also reported. The types of conditions that have been associated with this organism include septic abortions, uh, proctitis and proctocolitis, so inflammation of the rectum and colon, and also sepsis. Um, this may be related to contact with animals and possibly also eating raw food, although I think more research is really required to fully nail down exactly how transmission occurs. In people, we're most concerned with Campylobacter jejuni subspecies jejuni. This is a very common cause of gastroenteritis, um, it's estimated that there may be up to 1.3 million cases of campylobacteriosis in the United States each year. So in Canada, maybe we've got around a tenth that based on our population. This is typically a self-limiting disease. So you have five to 10 days of misery, and then it goes away on its own. Infection is by ingestion. So we typically associate it with unpasteurized dairy, potentially contaminated water, and most importantly, poultry products, because we know that birds are common carriers of Campylobacter species. And so improperly prepared uh, uh, meat or cross-contamination in the kitchen can result in disease. With Campylobacter jejuni, it's important to know that we have a very low infectious dose. So only 500 organisms is required to make you sick. So a single drop of raw chicken juice is enough. And preventing cross-contamination in the kitchen is very, very important. I put a link above to a video which demonstrates just how easy it is for cross-contamination to occur in the kitchen, including surfaces, your hands, and also utensils. So if undercooked poultry and cross-contamination of uh, foods in the kitchen uh, from these products are what we're concerned about with respect to Campylobacter jejuni, then chicken sashimi is probably a very high-risk product uh, for, for acquiring Campylobacter jejuni. Probably not something that I would recommend eating. 
This is some data from the Public Health Agency of Canada, and what we can see is the trend in number of cases of diagnosed Campylobacter over time. So on the y-axis, we have laboratory confirmed cases, and I think it's important to note that this is really only the tip of the iceberg. So we're somewhere between about eight and 12,000 cases a year over the last 20 odd years. Um, but many people who have these infections will never get a laboratory diagnosis. They have five to 10 days of discomfort at home. They may never go to the doctor, may never have a stool sample submitted to the lab for culture. So probably we have approximately 10 times the number of infections that simple culture positivity would suggest.